Twitch was far, far too excited about his part of the plan. Not because he got to blow up people who annoyed him. Sarge had vetoed mining the priest's quarters on account of how we wanted to still have a ship after the mission. But because he got to play with the biggest bomb he'd ever seen. Now, when I say biggest, I don't mean its size. I mean its yield. The first time Twitch made his way through the vents to where the priests were putting the bomb together, he'd wound up needing a new pair of pants. They were giving us a backpack nuke. It's been said, mostly by guardsmen, that the final step of becoming a full tech priest involves having the common sense part of your brain pulled out and replaced with a little box of screws. In our opinion, the fact that they were giving us a nuclear weapon pretty much proved that. Of course, they thought that they'd be the ones controlling it. They probably snickered to each other about how frustrated and scared we'd be, not being able to set off the bomb after planting it and not knowing if they'd remotely detonate it while we were in the blast radius. Still, though, it was a titanically bad idea. I mean... Even ignoring how much trouble we were able to cause with conventional explosives, we had a demolitions expert and what could loosely be called a technical expert in our squad. The second we were out of their line of sight, we were going to crack that puppy open and rewire the detonator. So, Tink and Twitch spent their time spying on the bomb's construction and planning how they'd rewire it and jam the Cogboy's bugs. Meanwhile, the job of putting together a plan to screw over the Eldar fell to Amy and Doc, largely because they were willing to do what the rest of the team was not, sit through tedious lectures on xenopsychology from the adepts. Unfortunately, we didn't know exactly what the warlock was going to do, only that dickishness would inevitably be involved. This meant that Doc and Amy could only come up with sort of general plans, but they still did a very good job of it. A bunch of contingencies were prepared for, a few simple strategies were mapped out and practiced by our entire team, and Amy came up with a rather nasty strategy for forcing the warlock to behave if we ever saw him in person. Doc quietly told the rest of us that he was glad not to be the evil mastermind this time around, and recommended we never antagonize the markswoman. When we finally came out of the warp at the border world, we felt ready for anything. Unfortunately, it turned out the other teams and adepts weren't nearly as awesome as us. Not only had they failed to pin down the location of the archaeotech for us, they'd also been unable to confirm that it was even in the system. Sure, a quarter of them had died fighting on the station, and half the survivors were still being tended to by Doc and his girl, and they'd only been able to do their research via discreet astropathic questioning and a few out-of-date field reports. Still, though, we'd expected better of them. I mean, a little professionalism and work ethic isn't much to ask for, is it? It was going to be so damned embarrassing if it turned out the Eldar had been lying to us. We sat on the ship for a few days, twiddling our thumbs and getting more and more worried while the other teams went down and made some discreet inquiries. Sergeant the Adepts helped them out, but the rest of us pretty much stayed in orbit and waited for the word go. Luckily, from our perspective, they met with enough resistance from the local government and Admech priesthood to practically prove the Archaeotech was there somewhere. Probably the only reason that no one tried to kill our investigators was the constant stream of ships pouring into the system at our request for reinforcements. Most of them were little, navigatorless armed merchantmen. But there were a few escort-class vessels, and the captain said our odds in a naval battle were definitely looking up. Still, though, from what we overheard, the locals were some seriously uncooperative people. No one would admit to anything, even when the interrogators started flashing their junior rosettes around. That changed abruptly when every astropath and navigator in the system reported a fleet approaching through the warp. 
While the incoming fleet was great for our investigation, it was also rather confusing. The only thing anyone knew for certain about how Necrons got their ships around was that they didn't use the warp. Of course, everyone said it was the Heretech fleet, but we knew better and spent a lot of time pondering what was actually coming. Honestly, it got very annoying telling everyone it wouldn't be a Heretech fleet, then not being able to say why. Sarge finally snapped during the final big meeting and just told everyone he'd made the fleet up to keep the tech priests in line. There was a lot of arguing and shouting after that, but luckily no mass servitor uprisings. Of course, about five minutes after he said that, a large group of what were unmistakably heretech vessels came out of the warp and demanded the surrender of all technology within the system. Everyone was, uh, too busy for much recrimination, but the captain did spare a few seconds to congratulate Sarge on being psychic. With the arrival of the Heretech fleet, everything started happening at once. Sword Guy, who was still too injured to help much in combat, transferred over to the largest friendly vessel in system and started organizing the overall fleet we'd been cobbling together. Armed with the intel provided by our ship's priests about the Heretech's probable armament and strategy, he was confident that he could keep the hostile fleet away from the planet for at least a day or two. Down on the planet, Battleaxe, who'd been leading the investigation, was approached by several local nobles who'd had a change of heart. The planet's nobles sold out their governor and put their forces at Battleaxe's command. The basic story they gave us was that the planetary governor had purchased the piece of Archaeotech and a team of scientists from a rogue trader. The device itself wasn't being used for anything, and they didn't actually know what it was but the technology being reverse-engineered from it was supposed to turn their little SDF fleet into the most powerful space force this side of Battlefleet Ultima. They were patriots, see. It had all been for the work of their world, and by extension, the Imperium. The governor had told them all, within five years, they'd be completely secure against any Tau aggression or Tyranid splinter fleets. In ten, their shipyards would be the envy of every forge world. In 20, they'd personally control all space shipping from here to the Damocles Gulf. And by the end of the century, the Administratum would need to make a whole new sector just to contain the worlds they'd use their fleet to colonize and take back from the Tau. Quite the statement, but every tech priest and veteran voidsman they'd sent to look at the thing had confirmed it. So they'd all signed on, even knowing that some Xenos force was chasing the Archaeotech and would need to be fought off. They were confident in the size of their defense forces, they said. All those other worlds that had been wiped out were little undefended backwaters, they said. It was worth the gamble, they said. But now that they saw the size of the Heretech fleet, and the Inquisition was at their door, they were singing a different tune. Up in our shuttle, we were listening to the whole spiel as we dropped towards the Manufactorum, they'd fingered. Everyone but Jim and Hannah, who were locked in the cockpit and keeping to themselves, speculated on just what sort of super weapon they'd found. If it really was such a big game changer, it'd be a shame to just blow it to little radioactive pieces. We were still going to do it, of course. Aside from the whole thing where it was a heretical piece of archaeotech with the potential to drive the Mechanicus to schism, you can't carry a nuke all the way down to a planet and not set it off. It's just not allowed. Anyway, as we went to go blow up the Archaeotech, Battleaxe was organizing a coup. She and her half-strength team would handle capturing the planetary governor and securing a temporary government with the help of most of the Nobs regiment. She wasn't hugging all the support troops, though. A sizable force had been stationed near the Manufactorum where the Archaeotech was located, and she sent them to lend us a hand. Well, actually, it was more a case of us lending them a hand. They had a lot less travel time than us, and we saw nothing wrong with them handling most of the grunt work. 
So our little eight-man force came down outside the Manufactorum after several hundred PDF yahoos had spent about an hour shooting the place all to hell. They may not have been quite as professional as leading some sort of high-precision strike force, but the important thing was that the place was clear and none of us had gotten shot in the process. A whole lot of PDF had, though. The place was a mess. That's what happens when you're dumb enough to try to rush fortified positions. Poor dumb guard wannabes. Per our orders, the PDF had stayed out of the semi-secret basement where the Archaeotech was located. They'd all just swept the upper building, which had been defended by a few of the governor's men, and as well as a surprisingly large number of servitors. The servitors worried us at first, since the heretics weren't supposed to be coming anywhere near close enough to shuttle or teleport a force down. Thankfully, when Jim and Anna came over to take a look, they said that the servitors didn't have any recognizable heretic markings. That was a load off our minds, and we followed some PDF general over to the basement entrance. Surprisingly, Jim and Hannah both tagged along instead of returning to their shuttle. Sarge weighed the pros and cons of having two cogboys around when we went to blow up some piece of really cool tech, and decided to trust them. The engine seers fell in behind Twitch, who was lugging a rather heavy backpack containing a large metal cylinder with an unnecessary amount of ornamentation on its surface. The bomb did not have any exterior controls, readouts, or anything aside from what Jim told us were etchings of holy scenes and prayers written in binary. It looked like a drum for storing holy water more than anything. It was about the right size and weight, We'd had to scrounge a grav plate and clamp it to the bottom for anyone but Sarge to be able to carry the thing. Presumably, the whole reason for the bomb's odd design was that there were no exposed controls for us to muck around with and no way to see inside. It should have stopped anyone who wasn't entirely suicidal from trying to go in and rewire its detonator. But Twitch had the thing cut open within ten minutes of our shuttle's departure. Now, the nuke's top was held on with duct tape. Its remote control was hooked up to a novelty noisemaker, and the only way to set it off was using the detonator Sarge was carrying. After a rather unpleasant walk through the corpse-filled building, we reached the entrance to the underground lab where the archaeotech was stored. We stood around the intimidating entrance for a while, wondering just what sort of defenses were waiting down there and if it would do any harm to send a few squads of PDF down first. Our little debate was interrupted by a call from the captain, who warned us that the fleet engagement had started, and that, inexplicably, all astropathic communications were being blocked. Jim blanched at hearing that second part, and told us that the heretics didn't have a way to do that. The Necrons were here. Confirmation arrived in the form of a few dozen green lightning storms outside the window. They weren't violent enough to be an orbital bombardment, and faded quickly. But they left behind some very ominous glowing clouds. Tink went over to a window and ratcheted up the zoom on his goggles, then went pale and recommended that we go blow up the Archaeotech right now. There wasn't time to fool around with sending scouts down there. And anyway, the PDF would need all the men they had to fight off the millions of metal insects that had just teleported into the atmosphere. We didn't need telling twice and practically sprinted into the basement, only stopping to advise the PDF general to conserve ammo and save his last round for himself. Twitch and Fumbles went first to check for traps and ambushes. Sarge tried to take the nuke from Twitch before he took point, but the demolitions trooper flatly refused. He claimed the bomb was his now, and he'd be damned if anyone would take it from him. Anyway, he said it wasn't getting in his way, and it actually helped him concentrate. Just carrying it made him feel all warm and fuzzy inside, he said. The rest of us thought that sounded like it was leaking radiation, but didn't push the issue. Aside from a few traps, which Twitch easily disarmed, the stairs down there weren't defended by anyone. 
Either they'd all fought and died on the surface, or they'd fallen back to the big room at the bottom of the stairs. We all bet on the latter and formed up to breach the final door. The charges went off, flashes were tossed, and we all rushed in with weapons raised. Then we all sheepishly walked down the empty hallway to what was actually the final door, and did it all again. This time, a hail of laze fire poured out at us as we scrambled to find cover in a very large room. Luckily, in addition to being very large, the room was littered with all sorts of conduits, machinery, and inexplicably chest-high walls. Through a combination of luck and skill, we all managed to find something solid to hide behind, and started trading fire with what looked to be five tech priests. Originally, we'd had some vague plan that Tink would find where in the room the Archaeotech was, and Twitch would plant the bomb while the rest of us held off the defenders. But that didn't turn out to be necessary. For one thing, it was easy to see where the Archaeotech was. A massive, opaque shield took up the rear half of the room. For another, the tech priests didn't need to be held off. They were pathetic. These guys weren't anything like the sort of mechanical combat monstrosities we'd expected. They were just relatively normal tech priests with laser pistols. They hold up behind some ineffective cover, and we just picked them off one by one while Jim and Hannah made a half-hearted attempt to negotiate their surrender. There was just one of the tech priests left, and we were arguing over whether to try and take him alive so he could deactivate the shield. Then we all heard a metal stomping sound and something that looked like a cross between a dreadnought, a necron, and a metal squid came around the edge of the shield. That description doesn't really do the metal monstrosity justice. Start by imagining a dreadnought made of that weird metal that the Tau use for everything. You know, the tan stuff. Now, replace its arms with a pair of those green tube Necron weapons. The kind that shoot lightning that evaporates whatever it hits. Finally, imagine that instead of it having an armored front plate protecting a dead hero of the Imperium, it has this writhing ball of mechadendrites, and somewhere in the middle is a crazy tech priest screaming in binary. We were so incredibly screwed, it was almost funny. We had been expecting something worse than a few schmucks with laser pistols. But for once, our cynicism and paranoia had been insufficient. We all just stared for a second as the thing stomped towards us. Almost absentmindedly, Amy headshot the last wimpy tech priest. Then the green tube started charging up and Sarge screamed at everyone to pop smoke and scatter. Cover wasn't going to do shit against those Necron beams. As the room filled with smoke, the beams started lancing out and leaving big empty gouges in the floor. Operating pretty much independently, everyone started readying what anti-armor equipment they had. Sarge started the show by peeking through the edge of the smoke, noticing he was behind the dreadnought, and activating the special rangefinder dealy on his totally not a Tau pulse carbine, to everyone but Tink's surprise, it worked perfectly. He and Amy suddenly had the location of the dreadnought displayed on their goggles and scope respectively. Two balls of plasma, one big and fat, the other small and fast, flew out of the smoke. They both hit the dreadnought and the mass of mechadendrites that passed for a torso, but only managed to burn a few of the tentacles off. The dreadnought aimed down the gaps in the smoke the shots had left and returned fire. Tink was away before his shot even hit. But Amy wasn't as quick, and her world went green. None of us were in position to see what happened, but Amy screamed like a stuck grox and flooded the comms channel with an incredible stream of curses. We took that as a sign that she'd live and concentrated on the fight. Not having fancy targeting toys, Nubby and Tink had to find gaps in the smoke to make their attacks through. Nubby hung back and put some well-aimed last shots into the dreadnought, causing it to stomp towards him, while Twitch darted forward with a deck pack. Sarge groaned when he saw Twitch sprint out of the smoke with the nuke still strapped to his back, 
then nearly had a heart attack when one of the dreadnought's weapons swiveled towards the demolitions trooper. Thinking quickly, he activated his auxiliary grenade launcher and fired a Tau flash grenade between Twitch and the dreadnought. The dreadnought's beam missed Twitch's nuclear backpack by centimeters, and the blinded trooper slammed helmet first into one of its legs. Now stunned as well as blind, Twitch staggered around for a second, then suddenly disappeared as Fumbles stuck his head out of the smoke. The dreadnought stomped around for a second, trying to find Twitch, then gave up and returned to chasing Nubby as another hail of laser shots hit it. Sarge confirmed that Twitch was still alive, then ran off into the smoke to emulate Nubby's hit-and-run harassment. While everyone else was running and shooting, Tink sat still and waited for his plasma gun to recharge. As he waited, he noted Sarge wasn't marking the target anymore, and sent Spot out to keep an eye on things. Thanks to the drone's vid feed, he was the first of us to notice that the dreadnought was slowing down a little. Initially, he put it down to some sort of battle damage, but then he spotted the familiar-looking skulls flying above the smoke. As he watched, one of them darted down and attached itself to two others on the dreadnought's back, causing it to slow down a little more. Jim and Hannah's skulls saved all of our lives as we pulled ourselves back together. None of us were sure what exactly they were doing, and the engine seers seemed too busy to explain, but the dreadnought got slower and more inaccurate with each passing second. Everyone stayed back and peppered it with lays and plasma, forcing it to constantly stomp around hunting for us. It was looking like we'd be able to wear the thing down, especially since Amy had got back into the fight, then the tech priest caught on. He let out an incredibly pissed-sounding scream, and his mechadendrites started ripping the skull off of his back. He'd caught on to our only real trick, but he was distracted. It was time to do or die. Twitch shared some debt packs with Sarge. Fumbles cloaked them both, and they ran in. It probably would have worked, but it wound up not having to. When the sprinters were halfway to the dreadnought, its mechadendrites started bursting apart with little flashes of light. A few seconds later, the flashes were followed by a very familiar lance cannon beam and one of those hell orbs. Finally, a blast of raw psychic energy came out of the smoke and slammed right into the middle of the dreadnought's tentacle face. That was apparently the thing's limit. It let out a sound like blender with a rock in it, powered down and toppled backwards. The warlock swept out of the smoke with two of his wraith guards in tow. The one with the weird hell gun set about methodically sucking pieces of the dreadnought into the warp, while the other didn't quite aim its laser cannon at us. The warlock walked up to Sarge, congratulated him on holding out for so long, then apologized for not arriving sooner he'd had more important matters to take care of. Sarge didn't deck the smug bastard, but it was a near thing. Given that the warlock was there in person, and had a pair of wraith guards with him, we were much more polite this time. Sarge made an attempt at diplomatic small talk while the rest of us formed up and took stock. Mostly, we were just bruised, exhausted, and low on ammo. Amy was the only one of us who'd taken an actual hit. When Jim and Hannah helped her through the smoke, the conversation stopped for a second as everyone stared. Her hair and helmet had been given what you might call a reverse mohawk. The Necron beam had been a millimeter from taking the top of her head off. Everyone quickly found something else to look at especially the other figures coming through the smoke. The Warlock's rangers were practically dragging two short figures. One we all recognized as a Tau Earthcast, but the other looked like a monkey that someone had been testing Augmetics on. The Tau was frantic, and when he saw us, he started babbling at us in Gothic. He'd been kidnapped, which was illegal, then enslaved, which was doubly illegal, then forced to work with all sorts of mentally unstable people, 
and now he was kidnapped again, and he just wanted to go home. Sarge digested this for a second, then shot a confused look at the warlock. He said that the Tau was the last of the Archaeotech science team, and ordered him to deactivate the shield. We all followed the Tau scientist to a cogitator station, listening to a steady list of complaints on the way. The monkey remained silent, but tried to bite the ranger holding it a few times. Once at the station, the Tau pressed a few buttons and asked Sarge to flip a heavy-looking lever. The shield vanished with a loud crack and revealed the archaeotech that had caused all this trouble. Jim and Tana fell to their knees in awe, while everyone else stared. Then Nubby swore loudly, Twitch started laughing, and Sarge facepalmed. Tink peeked out from the back of the group and turned to Amy. Huh. Looks like a Necron ship. Wonder how the hell they got that? We checked, just to be sure. There was a slim possibility that someone else had gotten their hands on a damaged Necron vessel. It didn't have to be the one that we gave to a rogue trader in exchange for some fire support. The whole entire bloody mess, from the empty worlds to the damned Heretech fleet above us, didn't have to be the result of us cutting a quick deal to save our skins. This didn't have to be our fault. It was, of course. We could see the spot where we'd melted our way in, and the words, Nubby was here, glared damningly at us from the inside of the ship's open door. This was probably going to go down in some inquisitorial history book as the most colossal screw-up ever performed by a bunch of low-level grunts. I mean, cults and traitors typically have to work for years to achieve this sort of mess. We managed to achieve it in just a few minutes of panicked bargaining. Oak, or maybe even the Lord Inquisitor himself, was going to nail our ears to the wall and peel our skin off with a dull spoon over this. Assuming we survived the current mess, that is. Amy, Tink, and the rest of the team caught on to what was going on in a few seconds. They'd heard that story more than a few times. The Eldar didn't get it, though, and just stared at us as we all alternated between swears, moans, and hysterical laughter. Eventually, the warlock got frustrated trying to piece things together and demanded an explanation from Sarge. Our fearless leader was obviously not thinking clearly, because in a fit of retardation, he told the Xenos the truth. Oh boy, was he pissed. The lecture we got was a nice preview of the one we'd inevitably get when we made our end-of-mission report. The word incompetent was used at least 30 times, and it was amazing how many synonyms for idiot the warlock could think up. It was quite embarrassing, but the sheer grating annoyance of being lectured by the smug Xenos bastard eventually brought us back to reality. The lecture ended with a wail of, Do you know how much time and life you've wasted with your own stupidity? Which Sarge sourly counted with, Oh, shut up. We're guardsmen. Wasting time and life is practically our job description. While the warlock searched for more words to express his outrage, Sarge ordered the rest of us to secure the ship, and asked the warlock what his plan for sorting all this out was. Sarge and the Eldar argued over whether the heretics and necrons would leave the system if we just blew up the ship, while they did, the rest of us took the Tau prisoner and inspected the ship. It had changed a lot since we'd last seen it. The place was practically filled with things that looked like a hybrid of Tau and Imperial tech. Jim and Hannah snapped out of the religious daze they'd been in and, after a bit of outrage about how heretical everything was, started asking the terrifying scientist questions. Playing tour guide seemed to calm the Tau down immensely. He led the tech priests around the ship with Tink tagging along and asking annoying questions. 
They were given a completely incomprehensible summary of how the scientist had merged Tau, Imperial, and Jokero Tech into something that could interface with Necron systems. Supposedly, that let them reverse engineer pieces of the tech and make their own versions or something. It was pretty much impossible to follow. While the nerds babbled about how this was the greatest scientific advancement in centuries, Twitch and Nubby went to find a place to plant the nuke and blow it all up. There's probably something deep and philosophical you could say about that. But we were guardsmen. We had a really big bomb, and damned if we weren't going to use it. Twitch slid the actual go-boom part of the bomb out of its decorative cylinder and crammed it into an out-of-the-way crevice. He was literally vibrating with excitement as he taped the thing into place and armed it. Outside, Amy and Fumbles watched Sarge's back as he brainstormed with the Eldar, and over the secure comm, Tink and Jim had rigged, the Adepts. It was a rather tense situation, especially when the senior tech priests started repeatedly trying to call Sarge's main comm. Luckily, everything stayed subcritical, and a plan was formed. The ship had to be destroyed, of course, as did the facility and any notes. The problem was that neither the Necrons nor the Heretics were likely to leave the system until they'd checked the planet over themselves. Since that checking would doubtlessly involve the death by Scarab Swarm or demonic machine of everyone on the planet, that wasn't an ideal solution. For a while, they toyed with the idea of taking the ship, which the scientists had gotten flying again and running. The theory was that the Necrons and Heretex would follow it and leave the planet alone, but the Eldar pointed out that the vessel wasn't warp capable, and the Necrons would catch anything that was. Really, the only way to save the planet was to somehow stall the attackers until reinforcements arrived, or get them in a fight with each other. To this end, Sarge suggested just giving the ship to the Heretex with the experimental Tau tech on it mined, but the nuke left out. This was vetoed by the Warlock as well as Jim and Hannah. Finally, after a little debate, an even more suicidal plan was agreed on. The ship would be flown between the Heretech fleet and the region of space where the Eldar said the Necrons were hiding. When both fleets closed on the prize, the ship's teleportation jammers would be dropped, and the Necrons would be forced to kill all the Heretechs in case they ported something off the ship. If, somehow, the Heretechs looked like they'd win, the nuke would be detonated. The only questions left were who would detonate the nuke, who would crew the ship, and what would happen to the crew when the teleportation jammer went down. The Warlock promised that if we crewed the ship with the Tau Scientist, his vessel would follow us at maximum teleportation range. The jammer would go down, we'd arm the mines, and then we'd port out and he'd carry us to safety on the only ship in the system fast and stealthy enough to survive the ensuing melee. For trust reasons, the nuke's detonator would be left in our hands, but also put on a timer in case something went wrong. Sarge eventually agreed. Everyone sprang into action. The nerdier members of the team went back aboard with the Tau scientist to prep the ship for its last flight. The warlock ordered his men to rig their own charges in the lab. Then, the second the Tau scientist was out of sight, and without the slightest hesitation, decapitated the captive augmetic monkey. Amy put in a courtesy call to the PDF upstairs, who were surprisingly still alive, telling them to bug out if they could. Finally, Sarge called the captain and other interrogators to fill them in on the plan. The tech priests must have been listening in too, because the little noisemaker we had their remote nuke detonator hooked up to went off halfway through the conversation. Sarge called the cogboys assholes and promised everyone else it would work out. He then got a final sit rep from the rest of us and walked over to where the Eldar was cleaning his sword. Sarge gave the Xenos his best parade ground salute, then thanked him for agreeing to teleport us out of the ship. 
The burly non-com held out his hand, and after an awkward pause, the warlock sheathed his sword and took it, looking Sarge right in the eyes and saying it was the least he could do. The Xenos shook his hand. Inside that stupid helmet, he was probably grinning ear to ear about how clever he was and how the annoying guardsmen would finally be getting what they had coming. Imagine how the Xenos bastard's expression must have changed when Sarge's grip tightened and dragged him forward. The final stage of Operation Screw Everyone Else Over Before They Screw Us was beautiful. Sarge and the Warlock both staggered backwards as Nubby darted forwards, and Tink pulled the lever. Before any of the other Xenos could do a thing, the ship's shield sprang back up and cut them off from their leader. The Warlock's sword hand was locked in Sarge's grip, but his eyes started glowing and sparks appeared around his offhand. This was interrupted by a sticky-sounding thunk as Nubby slapped a debt pack onto his chest, right over that shiny-looking gem that sat in the middle of his armor. The Xenos went stock still, hypnotized by either the blinking light on the charge or the way Nubby was waving a dead man's detonator over his head and cackling. Sarge released the warlock's hand, stepped backwards, and formally welcomed him to the ship's crew. He managed to get through the whole speech without cracking a smile, but behind him, Amy and Nubby were grinning wide enough to swallow an entire sewer's worth of shit. He wrapped the speech up with a little warning about what would happen if anything cut the calm connection to the pack's detonator, then advised the Xenos to come aboard and start arranging our exit strategy. The Eldar glared at everyone for a while, then stalked into the ship while swearing and promising vengeance under his breath. Sarge clapped him on the back with a hearty, that's the spirit, son, and followed him in. So no shit, there we were. On a Necron ship, being piloted by a terrified Tau scientist, flying out to start a fight between a Heretech fleet and a Necron extermination force, and our only chance of survival resting on an Eldar warlock, who we'd taken hostage by gluing a debt pack to his spirit gem. Gotta say this for life in the Inquisition. It may be absolutely insane, but it makes for some great stories. Our flight up to orbit was less interesting than you'd think. We didn't have any windows to see the massive swarm of Necron scarabs we were flying through. Mostly, we ran around placing all of Twitch's debt packs and helping the Tau keep all the jury-rigged systems running. The little guy was terrified to the point of gibbering by the situation, and Fumbles was put on duty behind him, pumping a constant stream of positive mental energy or whatever. Sarge took the detonator from Nubby and hung out with Amy and the warlock, and ironed out the last little pieces of the plan. Like when the Imperial fleet would disengage, and how the teleporting would actually work. The Eldar seemed to have accepted that all he had to do to get out of the situation in one piece was not be a dick. This was probably very hard for him, dickishness being the nature of Eldar and all, but aside from being a little surly, he was coping. In fact, spirits were high all around after Fumbles calmed the Tau down. The only people who seemed to be unsure about the plan were Jim, Hannah, and Tink. The techies were all rather torn by the way we were about to destroy a technomagical marvel, and the fact that the Eldar flatly refused to allow the Tau to live. The warlock held that the fact that we felt sorry for him was immaterial. He would have to stay and keep flying evasively while we ported out. A mine would be placed on his seat to ensure he didn't fall into enemy hands. Sarge pointedly ignored the mutinous looks and whispering the statement generated. It took an amazingly short amount of time to reach the edge of the fleet engagement. Necron ships are ludicrously fast. As we edged around the Imperial fleet, some final preparations were made. There was going to be a brief period of time between when the ship's teleporter jammer went down 
and when the Eldar vessel would be able to get us out of there. Because science or something. That meant we'd have to ford up together on the fancy pad thingy, and hold off whatever ported in, then activate the mines and nukes timer right as we ported out. So barricades were constructed and lines of fire were cleared, while Sarge went over the ship's big Vox station and opened up the general channel. Sarge loudly, jovially even, announced that the Archaeotech was right here, and the Heretechs could bloody well have it if they could catch him. He panned the vid feed around a little, then to really sell things, walked over to the Tau scientist and asked him to say hi to the crazy metal men. Both groups of them. The Tau let out a sort of high-pitched wheezing sound and tried to slap the recorder away. Sarge laughed and reminded everyone that this was the last surviving scientist that had been studying the ship. This was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, folks. Then he cut the feed, but left the transmitter on so everyone could find us. We were all watching on the ship's holo thing, and it was surreal how the Heretech fleet shifted. Every single vessel turned as one, ignoring the Imperial ships and burning towards us at maximum speed. Simultaneously, a section of empty space on our opposite side filled with little moon-shaped ships and a larger one that looked like sort of a fork. They were farther away but started closing the gap with incredible speed. All of us who'd been laughing at Sarge's little speech went silent and watched as they closed on us like two sets of teeth. Keeping the balance between the two incoming fleets was tricky, but the Tau scientist and his assistants managed it. As they closed, it got harder and harder to dodge incoming fire, and the shield started soaking shots, and we all watched the timer until both the heretics were in teleportation range carefully. Everyone had their own little nervous reactions as the enemy closed, ranging from Amy repeatedly checking her weapon to Jim and Hannah praying. Sarge took special note of the way Tink was hugging his drone like a teddy bear, and how Twitch kept fiddling with the empty nuke case which he had been keeping for sentimental reasons. The warlocks signaled it was time to fall back to the teleporter and personally placed the mine on the back of the Tau's seat. As he did it, he leaned in and told the poor sucker to be careful to stay in his seat so the Eldar ship's teleporter could lock onto him. Seriously. Eldar are dicks. Everyone slowly filed out after the Eldar to where the actual teleportation would be happening. Tink, Twitch, and Fumbles brought up the rear. The techie was crying, and Fumbles was radiating waves of misery as well. Sarge carefully ignored them, but the warlock spared a second to tell them that they were pathetic, and to ask Fumbles to control his aura. It was making it hard for him to focus his own powers. Fumbles flipped him off. When the timer hit zero, Twitch activated his timed detonators, and Jim did something. The entire ship immediately filled with crackling electricity and a wave of pressure that nearly deafened us. What ported in was horrific. The dreadnought thing we'd fought down in the lab had nothing on these guys. They were like the Skitari that accompany the Titan legions crossed with demons. There was metal and flesh and guns and claws and way more tentacles than anyone should ever have to see in one place. We all froze for a second, then before we could fire, the second wave arrived. The Necron's teleporters seemed a little smoother than the Heretech's. There wasn't any lightning or pressure, just a flash of green light. Then the ship was completely packed with metal skeletons. Giant, clawed metal worm things and a few thousand scarabs. We all heard a tinny screaming from the Tau, then the explosives started going off. Everywhere except for our little three-meter pad exploded into violence. There aren't words to properly describe what we saw around us in that ship as we waited for the teleporter to activate. 
We held our fire and just stared into the maelstrom around us, trying to pick out what was an actual threat and what wasn't. At first, it looked like everything was just going to ignore us. We were too minor to pay any attention to. Then a single skeleton, taller and fancier looking than the others, stepped right through our barricades and raised a glowing green staff over its head. Three laser guns, three plasma weapons, two psychic attacks, and a pair of servo skulls slammed into its face. The boss cron rocked back and a literal wave of scarabs rushed over him, absorbing our follow-up barrages. Its staff swept downwards and was just barely deflected by the warlock's fancy sword. The Eldar managed to deflect two more surprisingly fast blows from the Necron's power staff, while the rest of us poured as much fire as we could into it. Then the world went white and everything around the edges of the platform disappeared. That had been the first teleportation any of us were a part of, and honestly it wasn't nearly as bad as everyone made it out to be. There was no muss, no fuss, and no screaming demonic voices accompanied by lightning bolts. Just one second here, next second there. That was probably because it was a Xenos teleporter, though. Anyway, the first thing we noticed upon arrival was that the Maelstrom of Violence had been replaced by an equally unsettling army of Eldar. The boss Kron looked around for a second, obviously didn't like the odds, then vanished in another flash of green, leaving behind a few dozen scarabs. We very carefully shot these, making sure not to raise our weapons high enough to threaten any of our very nice new hosts. The warlock breathed a sigh of relief and barked some orders in pointy ear speak. He then turned back and asked us to hand over the detonator and remain on the pad until we reached teleportation range of an Imperial vessel. Sarge kept his grip on the detonator and suggested that our arrival had damaged the teleporter possibly in such a way that it would port us all into the void instead of the vessel. All in all, he'd prefer to hand the detonator over after a shuttle ride to the occurrence border. The Eldar muttered something that sounded like, lucky guess, waved the soldiers away, and started leading us through the fancy but confusing corridors of his ship. We rode back on a very familiar-looking shuttle and spent the majority of the voyage trying to stare down the wraith guards and rangers we'd ditched in the lab. Thankfully, Sarge was able to keep things to a low simmer, keeping Nubby from saying anything at all, and covering for Tink and Fumbles, who were in some sort of depressive feedback loop. There was a scary moment when we got back into calm range of the occurrence border. Jim and Hannah both seized up and started twitching, causing Tink to break out of his funk and grab his tools. He couldn't quite call what followed combat surgery, but it was close. Tink ripped out something small and metal out of Jim's neck, and then they both went to work on Hannah and extracted something similar. When Sarge asked what the hell had happened, Tink said the senior tech priests were rather angry and left it at that. After that little show, Sarge put in a call to our adepts and filled them in on our imminent arrival. The bay we touched down in was some sort of racially insensitive standoff, with the ship's senior tech priests and their servitors staring down the captain and a small army of his armsmen. The warlock took a look around, laughed, and told us to have fun. Sarge flipped him off and handed over the detonator, prompting the warlock to laugh some more. After the guests had left, our little family squabble really got rolling. The tech priests were livid and wanted us dead, and the captain was equally furious that anyone dared to question his authority on his ship. The only thing that kept it from exploding into a bloodbath was the arrival of a sensor tech, reporting that the nuke had gone off and taken a small heretic cruiser out along with the ship. Twitch giggled at that. That wasn't the end of the good news. Apparently, the Heretics had decided that they'd settle for an unmodified Necron ship and were going at the Necron fleet hammer and tongs. From the look of it, it'd be days before either side had attention to spare for us. The captain called that as near a total victory as was possible, 
then browbeat the tech priest about how the archaeotech hadn't fallen into heretical hands, and there'd be time to wait for Juris. None of us knew who Juris was, but Jim said it was a good thing that we accepted being confined to quarters until he arrived. The first thing we noticed after being escorted to our quarters was the large amount of dead servitors. Then the fairly severe structural damage to the hallway. Finally, the note from old Bill saying that we were going to have to clean and repair it ourselves. No one in the engineering department was willing to even walk down this corridor, much less touch anything. They'd even cut a new entry point to the Gellerfield generator from a side corridor. Twitch surveyed the carnage with pride, especially the part where the doors to our quarters were still sealed despite the damage. He supervised the careful opening of one of the doors, while our senior tech priest and servitor escort stayed at the end of the hallway and glared at everyone. Once it was open, we all piled in, fumbles and the engine seers included, then sealed the door behind us. After a quick sweep to check out for any bugs, the techies confirmed the room was clean, and Twitch dropped the nuke case he'd still been carrying. To Sarge's complete lack of surprise, when the lid was popped off, a nearly asphyxiated Tau scientist plopped onto the floor, followed by Tink's drone controller. After the little guy had a minute to breathe and get his bearings, he was incredibly grateful. In what Sarge thought was an incredibly annoying voice, he thanked us for the rescue, then asked what he could do to repay us when we'd return him to the Tau Empire. Everyone kept quiet on that last part, but Tink butted forward. He announced that for a start, the scientist could help him build a new drone. Spot had died for him, after all. Then the techie started crying again, which set Fumbles off in turn. Nubby led the psyker away to look at pictures of happy puppies or something while everyone else went to find something less awkward to do, like talk to Jim and Hannah about their complex crisis of faith. Well, honestly, talking to Jim and Hannah about religion wasn't that awkward. They were a little confused about the stuff they'd seen on the towified Necron ship, and now thought senior tech priests were complete assholes but that just put them on the same page as the rest of us. Mostly, we just sat there and nodded whenever they stopped talking, then let them sit and think when they ran out of stuff to say. As for the rest of us, we were actually feeling pretty good. We'd completed our mission, and no one, except Amy, had gotten shot. Sure, she looked rather odd and was completely up to her eyeballs on painkillers, but the hospitalier probably knew how to regrow hair and would hopefully go to work on her before she came down. Also, as an added bonus, if we managed to keep the Tau scientist alive until we got back to Oak, he'd probably be so happy he'd forget about where that Necron ship had come from. Of course, there was still the whole thing about where the Necron and Heretech fleets might stop fighting and turn on us at any second, but there was nothing we could do about that, so we didn't bother worrying about it. Over the next few days, we got regular visits from Doc and the Hospitalier, as well as the Adepts and the Captain. As a basic precaution, the Tau was crammed into one of Twitch's hidey holes during these visits. He complained about the treatment until we explained what the Mechanicus did to mouthy Tau scientists. Anyway, everything was going fairly well, both in space and down on the planet. Battleaxe had successfully captured the planetary governor and galvanized the PDF into a moderately competent defense against the Scarab Swarms. Several smaller cities and numerous towns had been de-peopled by the evil little bugs, leaving the silhouettes we'd seen on the dead world. But all the major population centers had been defended. After the Necrons had been engaged by the Heretics, the swarms had stopped porting in, so currently she was just keeping everyone stable while the space battle worked itself out. 
Up in space, Sword Guy was mostly keeping everyone from doing anything stupid while the Xenos and Heretex mauled each other. Astropathic communication was still down, but the reinforcements that were trickling in brought news of some other sort of major fleet force being gathered near the sector capital. If neither hostile fleet disengaged soon, it was looking like reinforcements would arrive in time. Finally, the captain said the tech priests were still sitting tight and waiting for Juris, who was on the way but had no ETA. Since it seemed like he'd be deciding our fate, we asked Jim and Hannah exactly who Juris was. Unfortunately, they went full tech priest on us and only said that he was holy and not something we should ask questions about. We left it at that. Things were crowded enough in our quarters without starting any fights. On the third day of our little incarceration, news came that the Necron fleet had disengaged. They hadn't been defeated by any measure, they'd just decided that the battle wasn't worth fighting or something. They'd pulled back to the edge of the system, then just vanished, leaving the badly mauled Heretech fleet standing there like idiots. The techs didn't immediately attack us, though. Instead, they opted to spend a while licking their wounds and trying to find out where the Necrons had gone. At least, that's what it looked like. After a day of waiting, a substantial number of Heretech reinforcements came out of the warp, and the whole mess of them closed on the planet. From what the captain told us later, the battle started about as expected, with the Heretechs slowly pushing our makeshift fleet back with sheer weight of fire. After half a day of holding actions, our guys had taken a beating and morale nearly broke when a major incoming warp signature was detected, coming in behind the Heretech fleet. Thankfully, though, instead of more tech reinforcements, it turned out to be a friendly fleet and not a little dinky one. It was an Honest to the Emperor, or Omnissiah, Explorator fleet. I shit you not, there was an Arc Mechanicus leading it. It wasn't even a slaughter. That implies there were pieces left over. It was a complete, bloody annihilation. Or at least, that's what the captain had told us. We couldn't see it ourselves because some batshit cogboys wouldn't let us out of our quarters. So it wasn't hard to put two and two together and see that this holy Juris guy was probably the reason there was a Mechanicus fleet here now. Sure enough, word came down that the system was now under his... jurisdiction. Everyone was to sit tight while he investigated reports of tech heresy and took corrective measures. This sounded ominous, but since the person who said it had a bloody arc at his command, we all sat tight. After two more days of stewing, stuff started happening. Some fancy-looking tech priests we didn't recognize came in and asked for Jim and Hannah. Tink and Twitch were in favor of shooting them, or at least telling them to bugger off, but the engine seers said it was okay. These guys were from the Ordos Juris. We were all sort of torn as Jim and Hannah were let off. They were our mates, and we were worried for them. But on the other hand, the cheeky buggers had let us think that Juris was just some guy's name for something like two weeks. Anyway, our cog boy and cog girl were returned without any signs of damage, and the tech heresy investigation continued without touching on us again. The priests never came down to ask us any questions, and they never searched our quarters for Tau scientists or disguised pulse weapons. It was rather worrying at first since good luck like this tends to be followed by some even larger dose of bad. But Jim and Hannah said it made sense. They started to explain that it was some sort of treaty between the Ordos and the Inquisition, then stopped when they realized no one but the Tau scientist and Fumbles was actually listening. Speaking of the Tau scientist, we were beginning to regret rescuing him. Quite aside from the risk of being correctively measured by the Ordos Juris, he was incredibly annoying. Fio, as everyone but Tink called him, 
was an infuriating combination of neurotic, naive, hyperactive, pedantic, and curious. The fact that no one had strangled him as a child was pretty much proof that Tau civilian worlds really are as nonviolent as they claim. Back when we'd been encouraging him to talk, Theo spun us a rather odd tale of the whole mess from his perspective. He'd been a technician on a Tau border world, and specialized at integrating other races' tech. He'd mostly worked in a government lab, but occasionally he'd go out to inspect some passing ship's systems. A rogue trader had come in, volunteered for inspection, and taken him to see a tech priest who had seemed a little strange. Shortly after he'd looked at the fascinating ship the priest had been working on, everything had gone dark. When Fio woke up, his fire warrior guards were gone and he'd been given a new job. Aside from the kidnapping, the slavery, and the fact that his boss was quite insane even before he'd had the Jokero augment his brain, the job was quite interesting. They'd stayed in their part of the vessel and done what research they could while the traders searched for a new, proper lab for them. Eventually, the trader had found this planet, brokered a favorable arrangement, then went on his way. After that, it had been much easier to get the parts and tools he needed, but the guards were much more unpleasant. Theo had been getting rather worried that he'd never be returned to the Tau Empire before we'd shown up and rescued him. We all just skirted around that subject. Anyway, the Tau scientist was brilliant and annoying, so it was no surprise that he got along well with Tink. What was surprising was that Jim and Hannah took to him as well. When they weren't all tinkering on Spot 2.0, the four of them would sit around watching Tau vids that Tink had gotten from somewhere. The rest of us avoided their area like the plague. Our sort of imprisonment finally ended just before any of us got frustrated enough to kill each other. Doc finally got out of the wheelchair, led the relief force with the captain, other interrogators, and adepts at his back, they informed us of our freedom and invited us up to the main conference room for a final debriefing. We were hesitant to leave at first, but Jim sent a skull and confirmed that the combat servitors that had been watching our doors for the last dozen days were actually gone. When we got to the briefing room, it was occupied by a single ordinary-looking tech priest and some guy who looked like a diplomat. Jim and Hannah practically fell over themselves bowing and scraping when they saw the priest, so we figured he was the head Majos Joris, or whatever you call it. The Majos responded by screeching something in binary, prompting the two engine seers to look embarrassed, then sit down and shut up. That was the only thing the Majos ever said. Everything else came from his diplomat helper. To start with, there was a presentation of legal documents stating the entire system was more or less Mechanicus property until they were sure no Necron or Heretech fleets would be returning. Battleaxe and Sword Guy were invited to stay on as official inquisitorial observers to the transition of government. Neither interrogator acted surprised, and both accepted. So it was probably fixed beforehand. The Majos' assistant continued the matter of tech heresy. The system was littered with little fragments of Necron and Heretech ships, but there was no indication that any pieces of the modified ship had survived. It was the Ordos Juris' official standpoint that this was a good thing. From the few scraps of research they'd examined and Jim and Hannah's testimony, they were of the opinion that the hybrid of Xenotech on the Necron vessel was deeply heretical and destroying it was the correct response. Our squad was congratulated for its thoroughness, as were Jim and Hannah for resisting the Xenotech's allure where so many others had failed. The two engine seers literally glowed at this. The rest of us tried to maintain our poker faces. Finally, the discussion came around to our ship's tech 
priesthood. In the Majos' opinion, their actions were not treasonous or heretical, but they had not been ideal. Since our ship's non-ordained engineering staff seemed unusually capable, the entire priesthood was being transferred off-ship for... re-education. Jim and Tana would remain as the ship's senior priests, and a tithe of fresh acolytes would be transferred in from other ships in the system to fill out the roster until we finished our return voyage. This time they didn't glow. Hannah froze, and Jim looked like he was about to faint. Tink slapped Jim on the back and said he'd be happy to help out. Sarge told them to shut it. With that final little announcement, the Majos Joris left with the other interrogators in tow, and the captain went to see to his ship. This left just our team and the stunned engine seers with the translator guy. To our surprise, he came over and introduced himself as a Majos as well, despite his apparent lack of metal bits. As he got closer, we all started getting uneasy. It got to the point where something sprang loose in Twitch's head, and Sarge had to grab his laser pistol before he shot the guy. Now that we saw him up close, he was definitely a tech priest. There's normal looking, then there's aggressively normal looking. The guy looked like someone had sculpted every inch of his body to exactly average human specifications. It was amazingly creepy. Anyway, the creepily diplomagos went to where Jim and Hannah were still silently freaking out, and assured them they'd do fine. The Inquisition was the perfect place for them. Both of them should embrace it, and take the chance to watch, learn, and grow, because they'd need every scrap of experience. See, when their service to the Inquisition ended, they weren't going to sit in some manufactorum for the rest of their days. Jim and Hannah had been marked for something greater. They'd be joining the Ordos Juris. This news did absolutely nothing to reduce the two engineers' panic levels, and the Diplomagos let out a very unsettling laugh as he turned to the rest of us. He handed Sergeant Data Slate and informed us that their ship had more efficient methods of communication than astropaths. The Diplomagos had informed our Inquisitor of the situation and its findings. Oak had sent this in reply. Of course, the Ordos Joris would never read the Inquisition's private communications, but he suspected our Inquisitor had an interesting little task for us to perform on our return trip. Sarge pocketed the slate without comment and tried to stare down someone who apparently never blinked. In an effort to save Sarge, Doc stepped in and asked the Majos if his Ordos would be taking over the pursuit of the rogue trader who'd sold the Necron ship. The tech priest switched his unsettling gaze to Doc for a while, then said that, in this matter, the Ordos Juris only had interest in those who committed or ordered the commission of tech heresy. Everyone who'd worked on the heretical project was already dead, primarily by our hands, and the entirety of the planet's nobility was being examined for... degree of guilt. Currently, they were not concerned with rogue traders being rogue traders, though whoever initially provided them with Necron Vessel would be of interest, or would be if the Inquisition hadn't already claimed jurisdiction over the matter, that is. Doc decided that he did not want to talk to the scary Majos anymore. Everyone clammed up and avoided eye contact in hope that the Juris would get the hint and leave. Smiling that creepy smile, the Diplomagos told us, unless we were incredibly unlucky, we'd never encounter him or the Ordos Juris again. But they'd be watching us with great interest. On that unsettling note, he wished us good luck and good... hunting then left. Twitch muttered something about the Mechanicus being full of weirdos. The rest of us, including Jim and Hannah, agreed. 
Nubby suggested that this was probably a good time to go get a drink, possibly in the mess hall where the betting pool was scheduled to finally be concluded in about 20 minutes. No one questioned how he managed to know this despite being locked in the same quarters as the rest of us. The mess was, of course, packed. Nearly everyone had been in on the pool, and even if they hadn't won, they wanted to see who did or if their stake would be refunded. Fumbles, the adepts, and the tech priests took one look at the press of bodies and decided it wasn't worth it. But us dotty guardsmen couldn't be deterred so easily, and made heavy use of our feet and elbows to carve a path. Nubby and, surprisingly, Amy were the most vicious about it, and managed to get all the way to the table the quartermaster was standing on. Surprisingly, he was backed up by the captain and some heavily armed armsmen. Upon seeing us, the quartermaster visibly flinched, and hefted his lockbox and ledger like some sort of shield. The captain prodded him, then bellowed for silence. It took the quartermaster a few tries to get started, but eventually he listed off the agreed-upon rules of the pool. He then began going down the number and size of the bets on each category, until he finally reached the winning one. In a quavering voice, he announced that most of the people who had bet on the Xenos species known as Necrons had been allowed to withdraw their bets due to extenuating circumstance. Nubby grinned hugely, then registered the word, most. It turned out that the only remaining bet in the category was a wager of 20 thrones by Amelia Deloresista Amanita Trigestrata Zeldana Malifi von Humpeding. Amy screamed in triumph. Nubby frothed in rage and had to be restrained by Twitch and Sarge. The rest of the room either exploded into laughter or started muttering about things being rigged. Then the captain bellowed for silence again, and the quartermaster resumed speaking. Unfortunately, he said, since the winning bet was placed by a latecomer, and w therefore was made with an unfair amount of knowledge, the ship's senior officers had decreed that the payout would be limited to a factor of 100 to 1. The remainder would be forfeited into a special budget to be distributed for the good of the vessel as decided by its most honorable and wise captain. While Amy cursed a blue streak and Nubby took a turn raucously laughing, the rest of the room dissolved into even more angry muttering. Finally, the captain stepped into center stage and announced that for the good of this vessel, the first use of the budget would be to supply this mess with unlimited rations of Sakra for the remaining of the evening. This was met with much more enthusiasm. As the party erupted around us and Amy and Nubby screamed at each other and the poor quartermaster, Sarge finally got around to reading Oak's message. Unsurprisingly, it was a new assignment to be performed before returning. He read the orders, swore, then flagged down the captain, who swore even harder. Both men decided they needed somewhere more quiet to think things over, and headed up to the bridge. As they left, Doc flagged them down and asked what was going on. He was shown the first line of Oak's orders, which read, The Emperor's Scythe Space Marine Chapter has agreed to undertake the capture of a living Tyranid Zoanthrop for study. You are to assist them in this mission in any way possible, and handle the transportation of the creature to my laboratories.